On the meantime, let's uh, bring in Dr. Francis Hutchinson. He joins us live now. He's a senior fellow and coordinator at the Malaysia Studies Program in ISIS Yusuf Ishak Institute. Uh, Dr. Hutchinson, thanks for joining us today. Uh, we're also getting word news that, you know, the Gabungan Party Sarawak GPS will be joining the Unity uh, Government, which is going to be led by um, Anwar Ibrahim. We've heard, you know, BN and uh, PN making that flip-flop and that U-turn. How do you see um, this heralding a new era of Malaysian politics? Do you think that uh, they are ready uh, to start afresh? I don't know about starting afresh, but what I think that is key is that the monarch, the king, as well as the council of rulers have come together and they kind of have two things that they're looking for in any type of coalition that is coming out of this current impasse. And the first thing is that it needs to be a representative coalition. So it needs to have significant representation from the Malay community, from the non-Malay community, from East Malaysia and from West Malaysia. So that is the first consideration. So everybody feels included, nobody feels left out. The second uh, consideration is that they are looking for a stable and convincing majority. So if we go back to 2018, of course, that, that you know we had that period until 2020, but then we had 2020, and then since then, it's really been a lot of mathematical calculations. Is there a coalition? Is there not coalition? Uh, sorry, a majority. Are we going to have a stable uh, ruling government? So I think the idea is now we want to get whatever coalition is in power substantially past that 112 mark mm. so that then we can focus on governing, look at reactivating the economy and not having to consistently worry about the government falling apart. Mm. You, you're touching on those numbers. As a matter of fact, Mohidin Yassin, he's still insisting, though, that he has the support of 115 uh, lawmakers, which is more than the simple majority of seats in a parliament needed to form uh, the parliament. Uh, just trying to get an understanding of what will Prikatan National do now that PHS Anwar Ibrahim is prime minister? What is his game plan here? So I think this is now difficult because prior, of course, to the swearing in, you know, when there was a little bit of flux, it is possible to get statutory declarations and then to go to the Agong and make the you know, argument, look, I've got a majority. But the problem with statutory uh, declarations is that people can make more than one and you don't have an idea of when it was made, you know, so you could indeed have duplicates. The other thing is mathematically it didn't work if we accept that Barisan Nacional was staying together as one entity, there just weren't enough numbers. I think this is what led the Agong to then doubt that and then, of course, there's the last thing, which is if you really do want a representative government, then if it's just a sort of very solid block with uh, PN, potentially some East Malaysians, there are still vast se sectors of society that are not included. We're also getting word uh, that Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim has just uh, left the palace. He will be making way uh, to the club to be giving his uh, first press conference as Malaysia's Prime Minister. We'll have that uh, for you in a while. But uh, back to you again, uh, Dr. Hutchinson. We're talking about BN. You know, they initially insisted on being the opposition and uh, not backing any coalition. Um, but the king has decreed that it must back the unity government. So as you talked about, one of the important things about how the coalition has to be representative, how East Malaysia and West Malaysia, you know, how are we going to gel uh, everyone together? What parties or coalitions do you think the opposition will be made up now? So the opposition, I think, I mean, of course, Perikata Nacional, so PN, so we would have Bersato, would have PAS, and then potentially some uh, smaller parties with individual MPs. But the latest news that I have is on the other side, of course, the go governing coalition. Of course, we have PH, Pakatan Harapan, we have BN, you've mentioned GPS from Sarawak, and there's also discussion that GRS from Taba would also be part. So then you've got all four parts of, uh, you know, all the four different communities and different parts of the country together. Mm. Now, uh, Dr. Hutchinson, last night's UMNO Supreme Council meeting resulted in members unanimously supporting Zahid Hamidi to remain as a party's president. 
How can he still retain support after BN's defeat in the general election? Or is that part of um, what the carrots that was being dangled to him? Sure. So I think, you know, uh, he needs to look at the panorama. And certainly it's a lot better of an argument to have that, yes, you know what, we lost, but we're still part of the governing coalition. I think this is a much better selling point and something that when he comes to contest in the upcoming UMNO party election, which should take place by April next year, this will be something that he can basically show. Nonetheless, I think it is possible that he will be uh, contested, and it is also possible that he lose. Because, of course, number one, there is the important precedent of both uh, Abdullah Badawi as well as Najib Razak resigning in the wake of not very good performances at, at the urns. And then there is also the question of, you know, his, his, his legal issues. And then third, there is the question that Amno doesn't seem to be particularly united at this point in time. And there are people that would want to ally with PN. So it is possible that six months uh, down the road that we'd be having other discussions as to the composition of the ruling coalition. But six months is a long time in politics. That's right. And the constant twists and uh, turns in Malaysia, especially. Now, it seems like this political deadlock, right, was only broken by royal decree. That was what it came down to. You know, it shows the king's mm -hmm. huge role, which was rather unprecedented. And also he had to consult with the sultans and etc. So do you see that that is where it's going for future elections for Malaysia, that, uh, you know, whenever it comes to an impasse, uh, like what we just saw? Yes. So you mentioned the word impasse. So that is really where the head of state, the Agong, plays a role in a context that we're so used to where your governing coalition wins 70, 80, even 90 percent of all seats in parliament. Then the need for a ruler, an arbiter is less necessary. But in contexts like this, and I do suspect that we are going to see more of this going forward because we've got three governing coalitions that are competing with each other. Uh, we have narrow parliamentary majorities. We do have instances where it's not clear who is the leader of a, an expanded coalition. It is in this context that the role of the Agong or the king is very, very important as an influencer and as an arbiter. And I do see more of that going forward. So it's not so much that the role has changed. It's more that the context underneath the role has changed. Mm, very fascinating. And uh, Dr. Hutchinson, I thought I'd let you know that I'm going to be bringing in uh, my colleague from Malaysia now, our Malaysian correspondent, uh, Melissa Go. She's going to be joining us from the Istana Negara in Kuala Lumpur uh, to join us in this Q&A. And I'm sure she has uh, some questions for you as well. Uh, there we go, Melissa. Hi, Dr. Hutchinson. Always enjoy hearing your views from across the causeway. Um, now that Anwar is off you. for his uh, first task ahead, um, he's going to speak to the media in a moment. What is one question that you would like to ask him? Well, there, there are many, uh, but of course, number one, the contours, who is in, who is out, second question, key priority. So what's he going to do on day one? Uh, and then from there, how is he going to reach out to people that perhaps feel left out? So th these three things. Mm. Those are very good questions, mm. uh, Dr. Hutchinson. Um, but I, I just thought I'd, I'd add on, because um, you mentioned, you know, like who's in and who's out. Uh, do you want to sort of paint us a picture of um, some of the suggested members that will be in? Are you asking me or are you asking Melissa? Right at you, Dr. Hutchinson. <laughs> so um, as we're discussing, it does look like it's going to be those four. So Pakatan Harapan and then Barisan Nacional and then across the sea, GPS and GRS. Um, um, another name that we haven't talked about too much is potentially Warisan. They do have three MPs. And, you know, in a context where you need to have a rainbow coalition, potentially they could come on. But I was doing the maths, and if we have those four coalitions, we already have more than 140 MPs, which is a sizable, solid majority. 
And uh, over to you, uh, Melissa, I just thought I would just get your point of view about, do you think that Malaysians now, I mean, that uh, they're obviously pleased that there is perhaps some form of stability, um, but the budget is going to be a big one that's coming up next, and it's going to be, you know, um, uh, that's going to be a sizable uh, thing sitting on uh, Mr. Anwar's plate. Well, indeed, um, without a cabinet, you know, just Anwar alone, he's not going to be able to call for a parliamentary uh, sitting. He has to request this to the king to call, for, form a cabinet first and then request to the king uh, to convene a special parliamentary session just to uh, table the budget. Now, the budget 2023 was tabled by the uh, caretaker or the former prime minister now, Ismail Sabri. Now, he's been rather quiet um, and that hasn't been passed. Now, he might refine it or amend it or table a new one, uh, it remains to be seen. But he has to get it done quick because it's already December and January. Um, you know, bills will have to get paid. Civil servants are 1.6 million strong. You know, they need to feed their kids. They need to put food on the, food on the table. There are many challenges facing Malaysia. Um, you know, the revenue stream, they're talking about bringing back the goods and services tax. But I heard this is not going to be the priority given that uh, people are still battling high cost of living. Inflation is still a concern um, and also commodity prices as well. So, but in the long run, he has to, um, he has to overhaul and rejig the economy, raise the revenue base. There's so many challenges challenges ahead. And, and also at the same time, um, I perhaps, Mr. Hutchinson, you can give your views with, with regards. Now, Anwar has promised that, you know, he would rather be the longest prime minister in waiting than rather be in the government with the corrupt. But given that, you know, a lot of the um, leaders of the coalition partners, they are still settled with um, numerous uh, corruption cases. And more actually will be coming out as we speak. How is he going to ensure his independence, uh, work out a way that there's still transparency and accountability and not get his hands soiled from day one? Okay, so here we come to cabinet and actually can I sneak in one last question to see if you can ask uh, Dato Seri Anwar. So number one, who's going to be Minister of Finance? Number two, who's going to be Minister of Home Affairs? And number three, who's going to be Minister of Defence? So now back to your question, when it comes down to forming a cabinet, this is going to be very tricky. Uh, he's going to have to bring people from four coalitions and within that different parties within coalitions. So there could be coming to your point about the economy, a bloated budget as sorry, a bloated cabinet as you try and increase to have a position to offer everyone. The second point, uh, when you come down to corruption and legal cases, I do suspect that these people will be MPs, but I would be surprised if they're given cabinet positions. So they can be backbenchers, but I don't think that they're going to be cabinet members. Rather, preference will be given to other members of the same party that don't have that type of back. Mm. Which actually sort of brings to mind um, about Najib Razak. I mean, there was a lot of talk before that, you know, that he was, he still plays a very big role. He was still pulling the strings behind BN. I mean, what's going to happen to him and uh, Zahid Hamidi, who has, you know, dozens of charges? So, I mean, I think with regard to Najib Razak, uh, what has been become very clear is that maybe he's a social media phenomenon, maybe internally within Omno, he's influential or what, but he did not help bring in any additional support, right? So I think that is has been debunked, right? So he, I think, is a, a shall we say, a relic of the past at this point in time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What but about however, leaders when it from comes Democratic to Zaki, Action I'm, Party? I mean, there could well be the same sort of discussion that if you do have a court case against you, I think in terms of equity and visibility, then, you know, they would need to be consistent. You can be a backbencher, but you're not going to be a, a cabinet man. Is there also a sense that, you know, with uh, Pakatan uh, Harapan getting, you know, this number of votes, um, that perhaps, you know, Malaysia, it's going to be less sort of race-based politics. I mean, it is still going to be a big part, but what I mean is less. So there I, I would look to the structure of the country's parliamentary system. 
So unfortunately, it is territorially based and you do have an association with where you live, whether you're in a rural area or an urban area, and what is your ethnicity. And there is a long-standing problem of malapportionment where certain parts of the country are given outsized influence. And these people, these uh, constituencies tend to be associated with a given ethnic community. Consequently, there is an incentive for politicians to target certain constituencies and talk certain ways. So I do think that this is going to be a kind of a permanent issue. The question is maybe at some point, could there be some form of reform as you've had other countries that have moved away from a West ministerial system to another type of proportional representation, that's one. The other thing is I think also long term, as you have more Malay voters living in urban areas, this is a driver for another type of debate because urbanization becomes very, very important to your identity. And then third, also, as we see now with more state governments coming in at, with different electoral cycles, I think states as an element of people's identity will also become more important. So the question is not to get rid of divisions, but to have more layers of your identity. So it's not simply race. Okay. Dr. Hutchinson, I have a couple of questions for you. Number one is, um, do you think that he himself, Anwar Ibrahim, will face accusation of nepotism, given that uh, his wife, one Aziza, as well as Nuru Iza, you know, they are, are in politics, even though Nuru lost, but one Aziza is an MP and is a very senior ranking one in the party. And secondly, how do you think um, his relationship um, with uh, with uh, Dr. Ma there, or with uh, Muhyiddin. Is there going to be a witch hunt after this? Okay, so first coming to your, your question about nepotism, I, I don't know, but what I can tell you is that I think this would be a, a, a relatively easy minefield to avoid. So, you know, they have positions within the party, but it doesn't mean me necessarily that they need to immediately get cabinet positions, and then we come back to this issue that you have so many different communities and parties that need cabinet positions. So I think this would be relatively easy to avoid. Now, coming to the Anwar and Mahathir uh, relationship, I do think it would be really important and healthy for Malaysia to move beyond that. So I, I hope that Tan Sri, uh, or sorry, uh, Dato Sri uh, Anwar can kind of look at other issues. And I think also, uh, you know, Tun Dr. Mahathir has indicated that he has other pursuits now that he's not going to be at the forefront of politics. So maybe this dynamic will be less important. Now we do come to the dynamic with uh, Tan Sri Muyadin, and I think that this will be an important one, of course, because he is the head of an important coalition. And they, they do go back way, way back to the 80s. They were the same generation in UMNO. They know each other very well. They were part of the vision team. Um, and I think actually probably their personal dynamic was an element in not having or not being able to forge a, a coalition sooner or come to some sort of seat sharing agreement in the run up to the election. So I hope that cooler heads will prevail and that, you know, strategic will imperatives will actually, you know, come to the forefront. That was really, really insightful. Thanks very much. Dr. Francis Hutchinson, Senior Fellow and Coordinator at the Malaysia Studies Program in ISIS Yusuf Ishak Institute. Thank you very much, Mel, as well, Thanks for having uh, me. who is uh, joining us from KL.